Morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome for our session. Puneet will be joining us from Australia. Um, after Ajay and Vijay session, it will be a difficult act to follow. A lot of you have been on Zoom calls and multiple other inline, online, on face conferences discussing what happened, what's the way forward. And we've heard terms like alternative accommodation, alternative food and beverage, challenges with people, availability of people, what are we going to do? And the three or four of us actually felt that a lot of it had the risk of going back. A lot of it had the risk of, as the consumer moves, as rates are better, we could have a chance of going back to our ways that were not really optimal. So we had to brainstorm to say, <clears throat> while everybody's talking about the new markets, the new segments, the new sizes, sizing and resizing within the properties, was there something that we could give back to the industry as certain pointers to take on, which could get you results in a shorter window of 16 to 18 months, would probably be logical to put together, help protect if in case another emergency would arise, not a, hopefully not a similar kind, but with the, you know, the world beset with wars and climate change and floods and droughts, things could change around us very quickly and we would have to battle another war in a different manner. And so were we prepared to look at it logically rather than just looking at the learnings of the pandemic and the way forward? As you've heard right through the day yesterday and, and you will probably hear the rest of the time as well, people are going to be a challenge. It will be difficult to find them. It will be difficult to stoke them into our industry. Um, but somewhere in this whole piece, is there a give? Is there a give for the community? Is it a give to encouraging our industry so that more people wish to be with us because they feel we are responsible? Um, is there a way to give back to the community that returns back to us should there be a problem tomorrow? So taking that on, um, the four prime candidates here broke themselves into two teams. Um, and we look at three subject matters. Uh, Seema from Preferred and Puneet from Accor took on the subject of ESG. Uh, for all of you know that ESG is environment, social and governance. And today funds, if you're looking for funding, are looking at ESG compliant organizations. And so, and if you're looking for that piece, then you've got to be much more in that business. Uh, as well as the benefit that it brings to the community. And the other part, like you heard yesterday too, is newer destinations, newer customer segments, newer employee segments, um, newer, simpler ways to digitize or digitalize your businesses so that you could get a quicker ROI in a limited period of time. So could we find solutions? And as we kind of spoke together, what was unique is a lot of us seem to be keeping our strategies and methodologies to ourselves. We are hesitating to share them with the community when actually anything that we learn from each other's practices or our own personal learnings as individuals and professionals, it could bring benefit to all of us. So I'll start the subject with what concerns Jatin and Samir, which is the newer segment, the newer destinations, and the newer ways to simplify the practices within the hotels. And what, do, what can they give to you as professionals and examples from, from uh, their companies? And then we'll move across for the tandem of Seema and, and Puneet as we move along. So, Jatan, if you want to take that over, um, what would you think are the two pieces that you want to share with everybody? And then we'll move on to Samir. Sure. So let me get this right. We first want to start with quick digitization of what are the opportunities sure. available. And then we want to talk a little bit about your new destinations or new trends. Uh, Sorry. Uh, hi, Puneet. Can you hear us? 
Hi guys, yes, Ratan. I thought I see you. Yeah, I can see you in front of me. No, sorry, I missed you there. Thank you. Go on. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so you know, when it comes to quick digitization or you know, quick stuff, what we can do as an ROI, uh, let me get through to some nuts and bolts. Um, I think we are in a stage of machine learning and a lot of time. And I kind of talk about from my days as a general manager, what happens today is we make it as a man versus machine. The whatever systems are telling us, we do not believe in that. It's more about our gut feeling. My take as where I kind of see things from next 24 months are going to be very important for our industry from a whole positioning point of view as how we come where the rate should be. So group pricing is one thing which I personally feel everybody should look at it. I have been kind of in the last six months with Sarovar and prior to that uh, with Marriott, where Marriott takes great pride in the revenue management system, but that is one area, one segment where nobody has been able to crack it. For a simple reason, a lot of that depends on our relationship and intermediaries and all. So I think that's one bit. Um, you know, we did speak about f &B, which Ajay was talking about what happens. In my opinion, f &B revenue management is super important. And especially when you look at where the growth is happening in tier three and tier four cities, where the business is almost 50, 52 rooms in FNB. So I think that's my second bit, uh, which I would say. But you know, more than that, when you talk about quick ROIs, you can also look at back of the house. It's just not every time about top line. But there are companies who you can tie up today who can bring in their technology to give you ROIs, which will help your bottom line. And that's a quick fix for you. The long-term plan, obviously, in digitization is all about retargeting and investing, which, which is pretty much a four to five year cycle. That does not happen overnight. So I don't want to talk too much about that. But I think today from where we are as a business prediction, uh, we can do a lot in that. So let's, let's put it simple. November, we always say is the best month, clean month, no festival. If any brand today comes back and says this was my best number as compared to 2019, it's not really the big thing because we don't know what the bottom is today or what the height is today. So you really got to scale it up to see, I need to go where I could not even imagine. And we, as a company today, have set ourselves some goals. What should November look like for us? And that can only happen when you get everything together. Coming to the second part of what the trends I force you, what's really happening. With, so with let me, sorry, let me interrupt you. So what you're saying is set up a new benchmark, not base it on the previous baseline. Absolutely. And, and I'll be very honest with you. We, all of us do budget exercise. We work, companies working on calendar year. Um, I was part of my budget exercise for 2023. And the first day when we met between me and Ajay, we were very clear. We're not discussing 2019 at all. And I don't even know what my 2019 numbers were. I don't want to know that. All, it's all about growth over this year. If I can get what I really want to get in double digit growth over this year, then only I'm talking. Otherwise, there's no point talking. So let me contradict you or challenge you a little bit on this. Where rooms are concerned, it's REFPA. We have access to STR reports. We all do competitive data. Uh, but what I find in other revenues, there is no such benchmark. There is no such registered comparison. And if the challenge is standalone restaurants in your, in your proximity, uh, how do you judge your budget and your market share? with so hotels or with that competition and how would you capture that data you'll be surprised and i'm glad you raised that within fnb uh, there's a company called comset based out of bangalore they've started doing benchmarking where you can individual restaurants can be benchmarked or for that matter your banquets but it's about brands who come together it's at a very nascent stage we are one of the use case today if i can say it. Um, you know hyatt has come on board Marriott has come on board i think accor has also come on board bangalore is the first uh, city where where you know this company is doing and i foresee that in next two to three years there will be benchmark reports to tell us what is your fnb pricing and how much is your market share it will happen for sure well and 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 about your part of the future that you would suggest to anybody on any kind of digitization efforts that you would like them to see or would you like samir to take talk take that piece forward um, no, I think Samir can take that. You had certain forward. examples of certain companies, you know, well, you know within, within the back of the house, as I was discussing, you know, within your HLP, uh, you know, I was in one of the panels on Hossi and we had one of the panel speaker uh, from Zenatix. They pretty much do that. They've already done that with Sami Hotels, where the ROI projects are there. You can cherry pick what you want to do uh, with them. It's just not about a big mandate which you have to give to them. So there are ways and means which you can look at, uh, you know, bringing some of your costs down or improvising on your top line, which is what we spoke about FNB revenue management or your group revenue management. Those are some of those basics. Okay, Sameer. 
So firstly, thank you for having me here. Uh, I think uh, from a digitization point of view, uh, if I just sort of try to add on to what Jatin was saying, the first part is the mindset, because I think hoteliers, we are still very traditional in our approach to operating our businesses. So uh, we, we still try to operate it the way we operated five, seven, 10 years back. We're generally way behind many other industries in adapting to uh, tech and you know some of those new age practices. The first thing is to be comfortable with adapting to it and realizing or accepting that it's there to stay. So it's it's in our interest to start getting comfortable and use digitization data, et cetera. So uh, we talk about uh, machine learning, uh, et cetera, or AI and all. But I think the first part is, am I comfortable using data? So for example, there are a lot of things which I can do just with looking at data points to improve my room pricing, improve my uh, market mix, et cetera. And those are things which I would probably recommend to just get started with because rather than trying to even bring in any technology elements, it's just important for us to start looking at data first. That's the, the first piece. Uh, the second piece in terms of digitization, of course, uh, just from a guest experience point of view, there's a lot we could do. Uh, in the past, we used to say personalization is all which used to be typically reactive because we, we had to react to try and build in personalization. Today with technology, I think a lot of it can be anticipatory. So uh, using again, uh, maybe best practices from uh, many other platform-based companies that are learnings which we as hoteliers could bring in as well. So a lot of us keep talking about customization and personalization, right? That's about stoking data. Uh, we've never learned how to stoke our own CRM data. We hold it to our hearts but it's basically dead data, right? So have you come up with any company or any practice that you've started yourself where you can massage that data with some AI help, uh, so, which has got you that result through the social media or other digital platforms to therefore have a deliverable set of customizations as, you know, Mr. Bennon talked about the morning, but larger companies can achieve it. Smaller companies will find it a little bit too a capital intensive. So very early stages, but I think there are definitely some uh, good, interesting partners around startups around on helping us understand how, for example, guest experience works. So, you know, picking up text analytics, picking up some of those key drivers, which can help us drive better uh, guest satisfaction or guest delight. And I think that's elements which we are currently working on. So would you have some examples of certain companies you're working with on? Uh, so so one of them is rep up in the industry. So right. I think that's some, somebody who's worked with many of us. I think it's very interesting when you talk about data, what sits with us, it's a very simple data, which you cannot slice dice in any way. Um, and, you know, I had the opportunity to be with Siddharth from Tribo Hotels. And what they have done is, is something very interesting that you can slice and dice by simply giving a command, even as you write an email that I want to see APC by hour, covers by hour, and you will get a report like that. It's about getting to a stage of data warehouse where every data dump is coming and then how you slice and dice is very, very important. So I think, I think there are companies which are moving into that space. And, and to your point, Tribo Hotels is something like which can help your small companies where intellectual property has already been you know, done and they can kind of, they're happy to outsource this to smaller companies as well. So I think there are case studies which are helpful. So ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we spoke about that is the larger brands, the institutional brands, are putting in a fair amount of funds in this activity because they have the wherewithal to do so. But I thought this would be an important piece to share how smaller companies or individual owners could actually translate this into reaction, action, and revenue or controllabilities because otherwise we have no access to it and we always wonder whether we're going to be big enough and sizable enough to be able to do that logically. Yeah, and, and you, you both had some thoughts around destinations and customization and a different change in, in customer mix uh, that you also want to share with them as to what has been your learning and what is your future. Uh, we heard from Mr. Kachu, glad he's walked in just now, uh, afternoon Mr. Kachu, um, where Radisson with him was the first ones to go into what we now find our focus area, which is the tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five cities. So what would you suggest to everybody here in the room uh, which is not driven by the larger brand and, and direction, but what could you advise everybody else to do? So uh, I think uh, we've, we've all spoken about this uh, over the last few years. Uh, in fact, Mr. Bakay alluded to the fact that uh, 
development is generally become a lot more expensive, especially in the big cities. So from, from brands like our perspective, we definitely see a huge amount of potential in the tier three, tier four cities. In fact, that's where definitely the, the real India of the, the next decade is. And I think that's where we see the opportunity. Uh, interestingly, uh, we've all been also talking about experiential travel. Uh, there have been enough studies and surveys which say that more people want to pick up experiential travel, 50% or so want to go and gain some experiences while 50% want to spend time amongst loved ones. So I think there's definitely potential in the leisure space. Uh, customer behaviors have changed thanks to the pandemic. Some of the, one of the few good outcomes of the pandemic that people want to spend more time with loved ones, friends, family. Uh, people have realized that there should be better life balance, work-life balance, and hence taking more breaks. So I guess there's a lot of impetus to domestic tourism, especially in tier three, tier four, which is where companies like ours will be focusing. So how would companies like yours battle the new AMA or the story or collections? Uh, because the brand width and size backs it up. But if it's all about personalization and these kind of experiences, how would both your companies battle this new market? We don't battle stories ours. Okay. No, I, I kept you aside because just to say, so, let's keep fortune aside. So, so having, having said that, I think uh, 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 the fact is that irrespective of whether it's story or mementos or welcome hotel or fortune, we all have sort of learned that there has to be a lot more experiential elements into the stay. So we have started looking at those. So across our leisure hotels, uh, it's not just bed and breakfast, which is the focus. It's also about saying, what are those five pieces of experiences we can offer to our guests? And what is it that should be as a minimum, you know, worked on by the general manager and the team at the hotel level, which is, of course, then communicated to the guests. Any newer segments? Uh, senior citizens, uh, child-friendly, handicap-friendly, both for employees or for guests? So I think senior citizens is definitely something which we seem to be uh, seeing a, a good pickup. Uh, there's definitely another segment which seems to be growing. Uh, to be honest, we have not done much of work in that, which is pet-friendly holidays. Right. Okay, so let's just shift focus and we'll bring the gentleman back into the larger subject as well. Um, Puneet, would you like to go first or would you like the lady to start? What well, would you let's, prefer? Uh, Seema start. Ladies, why okay. not? So Seema brings a wealth of experience, um, has grown fabulously with preferred hotels. And then we were speaking about what we could do for the world, not in the larger aspect that everybody gets confused and overwhelmed by the subject of ESG. But what can we bring back? And she's talked about a lot about what preferred is doing for their partnerships, for their recognitions, for their contracting. What are the methodology they're insisting their newer sign-ins and even the older pieces work with to bring value to the community and to the business at large. So Seema, the floor is all yours. We'll move to Puneet after that. Thank you, Mr. Keswani. It's uh, great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to start with, I think when we started speaking of sustainability and ESG, uh, we looked at it from two aspects. One is as preferred as, uh, as the company, what is it that we are doing and how far back the commitment dates? And second is what are some of our hotels doing? Um, so I'll start with preferred as uh, as a family owned family driven company, um, the, the uh, commitment to sustainability actually is driven by the ownership personally and dates back actually maybe more than a decade ago. Um, I joined the company about 12 years, actually almost 13 years ago, and I've always seen CSR as being one of the uh, you know, core values and of course that's evolved into overall sustainability. Uh, three pillars of sustainability, extremely critical and important for the company are uh, nature, which is environment, community, as well as culture. Uh, as preferred, I'd say, um, you know, the partnerships that we have in place with the likes of ECPAT to help curb human trafficking, especially with the role that hotels end up playing sometimes, uh, work with the companies like Wine to Water that have a commitment to provide clean water to the people who don't have access, work with partners like MasterCard uh, for their Priceless Planet Coalition uh, again, by giving back, I think uh, Mr. Menon in the morning spoke of Bonvoy, uh, good, I think good points with Bonvoy. Uh, similar to that, there is I Prefer program, which is our loyalty program, where um, as a part of the program, every time you pay with uh, MasterCard on, on the I Prefer uh, member rate, um, you um, basically there is, a, there is a forest restoration initiative in place uh, that, uh, that gets funded with that, uh, which is in partnership with MasterCard. 
We very recently, as a company, um, uh, signed uh, the Glasgow Declaration, which is about bringing down emissions um, half to about half of what it is currently in 10 years, and I think to net zero in 2050, what um, I think Marriott also spoke of. So um, a lot of commitment from the company, from the ownership, uh, we, in the middle of the pandemic, actually launched our uh, purpose-led, sustainability-focused brand called Beyond Green, uh, which is fairly new, about a year and a half old, which is all about sustainability. It's about providing a platform to hotels where sustainability has the, at, is at the core and center of everything they do, of course, with a commercial setup around it, but primarily purpose-led and mission-first brand. Uh, which is, um, again, you know, just about giving back to the nature, preserving the local culture, and giving back to the community. But everybody says all these practices cost too much money. Difficult to put in together. The formats of compliance are terribly difficult. Uh, I don't know if I'll get the result ODF, you know, ROI, or make an impact locally. How do you control that piece or that worry? So I think uh, it starts with a commitment first. I think it's about committing now and acting today and for the future. Uh, I think there are smaller and shorter term wins as well that one can put in place. There could be things like a farm to table concept, having your own herb garden. Uh, one of our hotels actually has a very great, it's, it's a very nice concept of having a, a worm farm to work on the kitchen waste to make sure that there is a reduction of usage of fertilizer as well. Uh, there are some uh, other aspects in terms of helping the community, having local artisans work on the furniture or allowing local um, uh, you know, talent to come and perform at the hotel and work with the hotel. I think we spoke about hiring local talent, which is, which is fairly easy to accomplish. We have a huge talent pool given the country and the size we are. Uh, some of the larger uh, initiatives, which probably require a lot more capital injection, like moving to EV, changing your furniture to, uh, you know, fully uh, sustainable, that may be longer term, but there are some initiatives that are in place and some of the hotels are doing a wonderful uh, uh, work uh, and, and job in, in that, on that front, which are fairly easy to accomplish in the short to medium term. Puneet, you want to jump in? Puneet spoke sure. about stuff that the company wants to do and what he would as a professional in the business suggests to all of you that you could look, or look at as immediately convertible results. So, Puneet, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ratan, and uh, thanks, Imad, uh, for sharing some, some very valid and valuable points. I, I think, I, Ratan, if you allow me, I just want to take a step back. If we were having this discussion a few years ago, we would have been talking it as CSR, right? Typically, the companies would uh, refer to to sustainability or social responsibility as CSR activity. But I think as we are moving ahead, we are realizing, uh, you know, it, it's a much larger topic. Hence the ESG, the, the social, the governance, the environmental. And I think it needs to start at the top. And I'll just share what we are doing from a core point of view. So just before the pandemic, we actually created a position of a chief system Chief Sustainability Officer, a CSO, at a global executive committee level. So Brun Pawson was appointed really to look from a core point of view, because it, it's not just uh, something nice to do. I think we don't have a choice as companies, special global companies that are publicly listed. Uh, as we know, whether it's uh, green bonds, a lot of the interest rates when you are borrowing capital is based on your ESG ratings. A lot of the businesses, when they're doing RFP, so it doesn't really matter how big or how small, uh, I think uh, hotel branded or not, need RFP business. So a lot of the RFP clients uh, need to understand your ESG policies. So I think that's where it stemmed from. So from our point, we started at the top. And then it was really important to create awareness. So what we've done is, if you, I'm not sure it's very clear, there's a banner on top of my screen which calls School for Change. So it's a four to six hour mandatory online training for all a core corporate office employees uh, around the world on sustainability challenges ahead and how do we mitigate these risks. And it's uh, to prove its seriousness, it's actually list, uh, it's uh, linked to our uh, incentive, incentive for 2022 and 2023. So it's a mandatory training, again, to create uh, the awareness. And uh, so from awareness, then we needed to kind of put uh, 
Our money where our mouth was. So we made a commitment, of course, to the Paris Agreement, uh, 1.5 degree uh, science-based target, commit to net zero. And for 2022, what we have committed for all our hotels around the world, that we will eliminate all single-use plastic in any guest-facing area. And I think it'll be quite interesting for everyone listening today. So what we did when we counted in a typical hotel room, doesn't matter whether it was a Ibis economy or some of our luxury brands, there are about 40 plastic single-use items that are in a typical hotel rooms, from combs to toothbrushes to water bottles to uh, shoe polish, uh, toothpaste, cotton buds. So we've made a commitment to reduce it. And what we are realizing as we go talk to local cooperative societies, buying local, we actually might end up saving by plus saving the planet by making this change. Uh, secondly, what is really, really big for us, which we are working on right now, is food, food waste. Uh, a typical hotel, a three to four star hotel, has almost 100 kilos of waste per day. Again, we are using technology here. We are working with a Dutch company called Orbis, uh, which use AI to help us reduce, again, uh, you know, measure the waste we do it. It uses AI. You just scan in front of the bin, the item you want to throw in the bin, and it gives you dashboard by the hour it was thrown, the type of item they're throwing. So it creates uh, the awareness of the kitchen team. And once you have the awareness, as we know, what gets measured gets done. Uh, you know, that's going to help us uh, to really reduce our food waste, whether it's batch cooking, uh, procuring locally. Another project we've introduced for all our ibises in India is buying uh, local coffee instead of, uh, you know, using typical Italian coffees, which we use in many of our brands in our hotel. So we are trying that uh, with Ibis. All the coffee that we serve in Ibis is around India will be procured in India. Uh, then there are some other examples of recycling soap, recycling linen. We're working with the NGO in Udaipur to use condemned linen to make sanitary pads uh, for women. That, that's a great initiative started by uh, NGO. So there's, you know, there's a lot of examples. I think the point I wanted to make, first you need to create the awareness, then you need to start measuring. Uh, and I think you'll pleasantly be surprised in the end, you might uh, end up saving and of course you're doing a huge huge impact to the environment so a challenge uh, somebody asked Ajay this question owners have just come out of a pandemic owners you know wanting to get their money back give me and you guys can participate too because I'm sure you're having these discussions any which ways Puneet and yourselves give me two simple points that you tell your owners say Please spend on this or invest on this because the ROI and the benefit, both functional and otherwise, will be reasonably quick. And don't reject this idea uh, at the cost of, you know, some kind of financial implication that might come with it. Would you be, would that the first two easy ones that you tell your owners to say, I suggest we do it. It's good for you, good for us, and good for the com community or good for the climate. Water. Just to each one of you. So water, you know, most of the hotel, we've always used plastic bottles for amenities, for banquets. So what we are doing across our hotels, putting water bottling plants. There's a company startup called Swajal, uh, which operates out of Delhi NCR. So a typical hotel, of course, there is a bit of, uh, they have various models, but typically we are going for the larger hotels, a capital-based model. The ROI is the less than six months, and then there's recurring saving of almost 10 lakhs uh, a year based on the consumption of wa plastic water bottles we were using. So, of course, we are saving money. Uh, we're uh, helping the planet at the same time as well. Gentlemen? So, uh, we, of course, went on something similar. Uh, in fact, just before the pandemic, we went on this uh, no single-use plastic-free uh, initiative. Uh, and over the last two, two and a half years, we were able to achieve quite a bit of success. No, but give me I one think point for the two things we did, which made sense from a financial point of view, even though it costed a little bit of money in the beginning. One was water, very similar. So there are two models. There's an OPEX and a CAPEX model. Right. So it makes absolute sense. 
and the second one is uh, disposable amenities in the room so moving to a dispo uh, to a dispenser from the standard plastic dispensers are, are absolutely financially yes, very smart i think uh, it's pretty similar and you'll be surprised when we talk about water bottling we actually did not face any resistance from any of the owners especially what puneet was talking about roi and and i think uh, today maximum of our hotels are already moving in that direction and the other part, part is the bulk amenities uh, which Samir was talking about in your room, which is kind of reducing your small bottles. But that is, those are two more into terms of your sustainability. But there are also, you know, today owners have also started a lot asking about future in terms of digitization. What is it that you want us to do, especially the new owners? Right. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, uh, we as a company, we're looking at building smart hotels and we're doing a project with our own hotel in Chennai, which will be pretty much... Uh, you know, a sustainable hotel, plus also to taking care of all the digitization and, and making all the, you know, things coming together in that. So I think those are the things which owners are asking today. Uh, and, and as much as we talk about digitization, that starts today when your business development people are out. You talk about digitization in a running hotel, you're only doing some bit of, you know, aesthetic work. It's the main, main part of, you know, work really comes into your building state. So I think that's what is really also happening by a lot of owners. That's what the key ask is. Seema being the lady gave us a cherry on the cake. Right. I think uh, firstly, I, my recommendation is not to ignore it. I think uh, everybody realizes we've been talking about researches, surveys that are saying that more than 50% people are saying that they, they are willing to pay slight premium, even for uh, hotels that are responsible or, or any kind of travel partners that are more responsible, especially Gen Z and millennials. I think uh, that is our new Correct. age customer. They are extremely mindful of the partners they are selecting. Uh, they, it is a part of their KRAs, I think, to add to what Puneet said, like for RFPs, we know that it's a part of their KRA. So I don't think owners would have a choice. There is no, uh, there, there is uh, no longer, uh, it's no longer a choice. I think it's a mandate pretty much. So I think uh, uh, switching uh, to switching out of single use plastic is definitely an easy, uh, easy takeaway. And I'd say, I think in addition to everything everyone said is going local. Uh, whether it's on local produce or local hiring of uh, talent, I think should be fairly easier to achieve. But when you're, so everybody's talking about local hiring of talent is one of the challenges. Uh, I had found before that in the smaller locations, even more than the larger locations or the bigger ones, that there's a bit of a reticence to let their family members work in hotels. How do you battle that? This, uh, it's, an, it's an education process. It's not just about um, a talking of, uh, um, you know, the kind of long shifts or long hours that everyone keeps talking about. I think as an industry, Overall, we need to do a better job of marketing the industry itself to, um, you know, to new talent. And it could be, it doesn't have to be all hotel management graduates. I mean, even people, like when you, when you go to resorts in Maldives, we spoke of Maldives, I think, in the morning as well. Um, hiring local talent from there, I think it's a, it's a part of what they do in terms of giving back, not just to the marine life, but also to the communities there. Um, I think it's an education process, uh, trying, to, try, trying to make them understand what it means to be a part of the industry and how we can all collectively make it a, a force for good. Uh, I think that would be important. So, Puneet, did I hear you say Accor has announced that they would cut emission or cost of the climate uh, impact by 50% in 10 years? No, what we've committed is... Uh, uh, Net zero by 2050. Okay. Reduce food waste by 30% by 2023. And how you do it, first you need to measure it. So again, I think part of the challenge in our industry has been, you know, and I think you made that comment in your opening remarks as well. The sharing of information, the reporting, the standardizing is really, really lacking. So I think what we are doing is at least for our hotels, to start a benchmark so that we know how we are producing, you know, more food waste or less. So there's a lot of work happening in food waste and internally we've given a target to reduce that by 30%. And uh, 1.5 degree is uh, the, uh, the impact uh, reducing that by 2030. So ladies and gentlemen, you've, you've got some tangible thoughts and some laudable efforts being made. Uh, on, on, on just the digressing on, on the matter, my erstwhile company to find uh, local employment uh, had done some good work on, so we all have this thing about we bust a graduates, then we drop into class 12 and drop into class 10, and then still didn't find people. And what they had begun was 
that they would identify people whose families were classed as being below the poverty line and would train young people from those families to encourage them to come to the industry and train and do an apprenticeship. If they continued with the business, so they would grow as they learned. But because they got the learn learning and they got the personality development, they actually graduated to other industries and therefore became an ambassador of faith for hospitality. Uh, but thank you very much for being a, a wonderful audience. If anybody has any questions, we have a couple of minutes to go in case you want to you know, ask them some more on the ROI or the tangibles. Uh, but thank you very much for your participation. Puneet, thank you for joining in in Australia. Thank Hope you. you're not thank running you. away to go and see a match now. Uh, have no, a wonderful not yet. Day. Thank you. But the floor is open for questions if anybody's got one. Okay, no one. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, lady and gentlemen.